I'm gonna. I, I wanted to talk about um, some of your autism research. There is some stuff. That I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm not going to actually because I, I know we're so limited on time now. And I think that's the, a couple of things. You 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 write in the book about schizophrenia, and I I just wondered about. I, I've been reading recently, for instance, in Nathan Filer's uh, The Heartland. Uh, he said that he felt worried that, and you do touch on this, that schizophrenia might be a much bigger umbrella term than people imagine. That it might be covering. A, a lot of different mental possibilities. Uh, and I wondered, Chris, how you, you feel about that. No, it's very, I mean, I'm sure that schizophrenia doesn't have a single cause. And in fact, recently there's this extraordinary, there's this book, I can't, was it called Bright Fire? Anyway, it's about this lady who had a, a, a an episode of psychosis, which was indistinguishable from schizophrenia, but luckily was found to be due to some sort of autoimmune problem which could be cured and there must i can't remember what the figures are something like six percent of cases might be like this and i'm sure there are all sorts of other causes as well but i think there's a sort of final common pathway as people say that it leads to these particular kinds of symptoms and i would probably be more restricting about what sort of symptoms i would allow to give you a diagnosis of schizophrenia so i'm not very keen and nor is Uta, on this idea of spectra so there's a spectrum of schizophrenia and there's a spectrum of autism and i think at the sort of other end of the spectrum it's not really not the same thing it's a sort of personality difference or something like that so from that point of view i would i would still think there's going to be some sort of common pathway that will be discovered for these extreme cases I wondered how you both felt about, again, I've, I've read a few articles recently from people who they felt that very often in dealing with different forms of mental illness, the mental illness was sometimes seen as separate to actually someone's real life situation. So the things that they might be dealing with, whether it might be grief, whether it might be uh, poverty, that, that very often it is here's the mental illness and the rest of it's ignored. And I wondered if you feel that that is, is developing now or whether we perhaps don't look at enough of the factors that might come together. No, I think I agree with that. I think we don't look at enough of the factors. I mean, one of the points that we would try and make is this, is almost, it relates to this distinction between nature and nurture or the genetics and the biology on the one hand and the environment and the experience on the other hand. And both of these things are very important and constantly interact and they sort of constrain the situation. But clearly you can have one person who has a terrible life, you know, being in poor or people dying and all that sort of thing, and yet somehow doesn't become depressed. And other people who become depressed without such an obvious lifestyle. So and you, you get the same with PTSD. So some people have horrible experiences of war and don't seem to be affected by it, and other people are. So there are these individual differences which, you know, alter the probability that you will get one of these mental illnesses but in most cases it's perfectly true that many of the people with mental problems would benefit from having more money and yes care. I think so too. Uta do you, it, it, it just final question before we go to audience questions but uh, what do you think now if, if you look back at that person that came to the Institute of Psychiatry in London and it was in the <sighs> 60s wasn't, wasn't it I, I, I think you came over what do you think would have been the most revelatory thing now when you look at your work now and the discoveries what what do you think you would have found most shocking had you found that out as you walked into the institute of psychiatry oh i that that is too hard a question i would have to think about that a long time um at the time i think it was it was really incredibly exciting to me to to see um experiments that were using learning theory from the lab to treat patients with for example phobias or or compulsions that it it was in a sense a shock then that this could be done given that what i was you know reading before was psychoanalysis and how you would have to have years of uh, therapy and you might have an uncertain outcome and all sorts of things. All of this uh, seems to be um, actually based not on science, but on some kind of belief system. So that that was a, a kind of shock I was, in a sense, suffering from then. Um, I, I know psychoanalysis is still going strong. Um, 
but I, I would make a very big difference between what, what is, is scientifically based and what's not scientifically based. So I think that behavior modification as it started in the 60s has been immensely beneficial. It has its limitations, but it was a, a huge advance at the time. At the same time, or a little bit before, there was this these enormous uh, progress was made with, with pharmacological treatment yeah. of, for example, uh, depression, or for example, um, some psychotic symptoms. So that, that has not sadly um, gone, you know, to better things. Somehow that I feel very sad about. That so seems so. got, to have got stuck while maybe the psychological treatments have moved on and have developed, you know, we have mindfulness training, we have meditation, we have all sorts of different things which are much more now sort of individually geared. Uh, they don't always help, of course, but we, we know still so little about all these conditions. And I think we would really need to know more before we can find really effective therapies, no doubt individually adapted, not one size fits all. So I think you talk in the book, don't you, about uh, propanolol being used with uh, for arachnophobia, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> well, you need to be relaxed. I think that, that uh, you know, to overcome the fear to begin with, the whole point is to get a very subtle and almost, you know, unnoticeable progression from, from seeing a picture of a spider which already can really uh, arouse a lot of fear and that's where the relaxation uh stroop, why not a drug yes that comes in very very useful i mean that's another example of the different the mind body thing collapsing that you can produce relaxation either by meditation or by drugs and they have the same effect yeah or you can just ask somebody to please feel relaxed <laughs> if they can do that i mean it can be can, can some people can do that <laughs> oh there's so much so yeah well of course it's it's not surprising this book is a big book there's a lot it deals with a lot and it's uh now i'm going to try and go through as many of these questions as possible uh luke who's in charge tonight if, if you don't we, we might overrun slightly but he can just he'll eventually just switch off but we'll if you're okay with that let's see how many we can get through uh soon sure. would like to know about the concept of the triune brain and how valid that still is which of course i suppose was Carl Sagan's Dragons of Eden was very interested in that. That I think, no, I think people, it, it depends what is meant. I mean, there are certainly these different levels of the brain. There's the brain stem and the sub brain and the, co the cortex evolved later than the rest of the brain. So in that sense, True. there are levels that yeah. appeared at different stages of evolution, but even the lower parts of the brain were altered so, for example, the way the cortex interacts with the thalamus is different. From his, the appearance of the cortex has altered the way the lower parts of the brain work. So I don't think you can really talk about a reptilian brain anymore. There's not this little reptile brain sitting there. Everything has been altered to cope with the vast expansion. It's a great pity because it was really easy to do stand up about that. So annoyingly, science has removed punchlines yet again. Uh, <laughs> this is. Uh, um, I, I, do you know the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett? Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so our question is: How do authors relate to the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett? Which I, I have to admit, I, I don't know anything about about her work. This is about um, the expression of emotion, and there's been a big uh, controversy about whether there is a universal expression of emotion and also recognition of emotion, you know, basic emotions. And Lisa Feldman Barrett has essentially questioned this and said that very much of our expression of emotion and recognition of emotion in, in other people's expressions is culturally determined and as that is not a universal thing. Um, to me, it's not such a hugely interesting problem no, I, think it's quite, I, mean, I, I think we would take the middle was it the third yeah. way and say yes she's right to some extent but there are some basic emotions yeah. like fear and disgust which are interesting because they actually the expression of fear enables you to respond better to the whatever it is you're frightened of and the disgust enables you to you know not to take in the horrible smells or whatever it is so there are some things that are very basic but it's also true that 
expressions of emotion like laughter are, are used as a means of communication. Brilliant, thank you. Deborah would like to know, would you agree uh, with her that uh, we need to educate everyone that a brain injury is for life and not like in the movies where there's a kind of just, a, there's a sudden, this is self's experience. And she says, particularly the invisible impairments that result. Well, it depends. There is a lot of compensation that is possible. That means that even if there is, you know, uh, irreparable damage, as long as it's very limited, it, it is possible, I believe, um, that some other areas can compensate. This is sort of uh, a possibility from this work on um, amputated limbs. You know, you don't have a limb anymore. The area of the brain that normally controlled the limb and got all the perceptions, the, all the input is kind of bereft. Um, but it can, it is it can said, be, be reused by to a, by other adjust yeah. uh, because of this inherent plasticity and adaptability of the brain to uh, do things another way. But I mean, I know very little about this. So I think that there are certain injuries um, that might not be for life uh, in some sense. But it's not the case that uh, you could just regrow the tissue, not yet. I mean, that would be wonderful. No, if, it's, if yes, I mean, that. some it depends a bit where the lesion is, and we don't, and some bits seem to be much easier to recover than other bits. So there's that. And I guess when, if other bits of the brain do compensate, then whatever it is they're supposed to be doing, they'll probably do less well. Yeah, so in that true. sense, you'll never quite get that. It's, it's not, not a good, it's but not a good thing. Also, the to earlier happen. the injury, if it's in, very early childhood there's much more compensation possible hmm. so, so you may with the naked eye you may not notice anything the person however who has had the injury and has adapted may be working much may harder. be working very hard and you won't notice um, this is a question from Abby, who uh, Abby has Asperger's and, uh, and was a neuropsychologist. And uh, it's quite, quite, I'll, I'll go through all three parts of this question. Uh, first of all, she said, if I feel too overwhelmed to interact with people in real time, can I still improve my brain by listening to, for example, this webinar? Or do I have to speak back and forth to really evolve my views? <sighs> Goodness. Um, this... but she, I, mean, she, I mean, I think it's very good to speak to interact with others in order to improve your views, yes. but you wouldn't necessarily need to do it in real time. You could do it via email or offline. Or, offline. or by reading novels. Yeah. You learn a lot of possible situations that people can get into and they each solve them very differently. But again, you it's something that's almost like homework, you know, to think about it and what can happen and what should have happened and whether you could prevent it. Um, it is difficult. I think it's when you say novels, because so much neuroscience and psychology is in you know nineteenth-century novels and beyond, which are before yeah. there were the tools and before William James, you know, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 fascinating. Um, Abby's second part she says uh, this relates to theory of mind and the Sally Ann test, and I'll get you to explain this, the, the the Sally Ann test because you're going to do it far more concisely than I will. Um, yeah. Uh, Abby says uh, she was the least efficient but the kindest carer at the nursing home she worked at. Uh, if I'm only imagining my own hell of being there, it doesn't matter, does it, as the end result is that I'm still kind? Yes, I think it's right. Absolutely right. And uh, that's one of the things about um, aut autistic conditions that we believe that um, it's nothing to do with a, a lack of empathy. Um, but it has probably to do, or at least a subgroup, I don't want to say the whole of what's now called the autism spectrum is subject to this, uh, has possibly a difficulty in very fast tracking of other people's mental states from minute to minute. Again, it doesn't exclude that you can sit back and think about it and say, ah, oh, now it makes sense to me why they took amiss what I said, for example. So this is roughly what the Salian test um, was first uh, used 
to uh, to give some evidence for. I should say that it is something a test that is no longer actually really working. It was never meant to be a single test for theory of mind. It's um, you better describe. It. I better describe it. It's it's done with two dolls, Sally and Anne. It can be done with real people as well. No no difference. Um, Sally has a basket. Anne has a box. Sally puts a marble into her basket, covers it up, and then goes out, leaves the scene to play outside. Meanwhile, Anne, who is still there, goes to the basket, takes the marble out and puts it into her own box, puts Sally on. Right, transfer of marble while Sally is outside and couldn't have seen it, all right? Now, this is very interesting when you show this little scenario to children between three and six years, because the three-year-olds won't understand really what's going on. The six-year-olds do. So the question is to the, to the child, now oh, here's Sally coming back and she wants to play with her marble. Where will she look for her marble? Now the temptation is for the young children, and indeed for autistic children too, say she will look in the box where the marble really is. The child knows it, Anne has put it there, but of course, as soon as they're turning five, six, they know that Sally would have to look into her own basket where, this, where the marble is no longer, because uh, Sally couldn't know that the marble has been transferred. She wasn't there. So this is just an example, just a very simple, concrete example of what it means to have and have not a theory of mind. But there are many, many other situations and many other tests that show this. So you can have little uh, vignettes in stories where you say, well, why did uh, Mrs. Peabody um, run away from a man who picked up her bag and you know said police burglar um, when the when the man actually only wanted to help her so the question is um, you have to think about what the uh, one person in the story actually intended and what the other person might have understood or misunderstood it's that kind of simple everyday thing that we uh, we do without thinking we do it absolutely automatically and the idea is our theory is and i have to say my theory still is that at least for a subgroup of autistic people that automatic tracking is not really working so it really really matters in in everyday life for their social communication it really is very difficult for them to um to understand intentions to understand why people might lie you know why it lies sometimes or that they might actually try and deceive them. So they do, uh, the theory does account for some of these things. Thank you. And thank you, Abby. I'm sorry I haven't got time for your third question, Abby. I'm going to nip, nip, because I can actually hear your church bell near where you live has already just chimed 7.30. Uh, so uh, we're going to, a uh, quick one, which is, uh, where does ADHD fit into the two brains, into that that theory? Well, ADHD is, is um, linked to um, executive function, which is to do, you know, frontal lobe development and, and being more in control uh, is, is, is all part of the same thing. And ADHD is really a description of what, <laughs> how very young children behave very normally. Um, it does just become a bit atypical and a bit difficult as they get older and other children seem to be much more in control. Particularly when they're adults. Yeah. And when they're adults, you really do also notice it. So it, it does fit in into the idea that there are individual differences. We do need all of them. We need people who have a bit of ADHD, I think, because mm. Uh, otherwise, we might become just too too controlled, too rigid, too careful. Too careful. It's sort of quite entertaining and nice. It's very amusing, I think, to be to interact with people with ADHD. And I think sometimes that in a group, in a team, they can be, um, you know, you need one. Yeah, yeah absolutely wonderful. 
And I think it's tremendously freeing when people do find out when they sometimes have had a diagnosis, because I think people who are not very good at doing a, th- a through line, but are very good at connections and you suddenly find out because society likes things that are very neat, doesn't it? And, and when to actually find out it's not a bad thing to build yeah. rapid connections, it may in yeah. fact be all yeah. these different people. Yeah. Um, Alison, just so you know, in terms of falling asleep in an MRI, uh, Alison says uh, she can do that because it cancels out her, her tinnitus and therefore she finds it quite soothing. She had one last week. Um, <laughs> um, Sarge, I'm, so, well, I'm not going to, you've asked the difference between an MRI and an fMRI. I think we kind of covered that a little bit after you asked that question. I hope, uh, if not, it is in the book and do also look up other things that Uta and Chris have done. There's a lot of stuff online them talking about ideas. Uh, Vicky says, uh, are there studies that have taken groups of people with certain characteristics identified by research and questionnaires, e.g. introvert, extrovert, arrogant, egotistical, generous, caring, etc., and compare their PET or other diagnostic scanning to see if there is any commonality between their brains for those characteristics? Uh, yes, there is work on this, which I guess we're not very convinced by. I mean, the, one of the big problems with brain imaging is it's very, very expensive. So the groups of people tend to be rather small. If you really wanted to study, say, extroverts, I know from bitter experience because of my PhD, you would need at least 100 people to actually get a, <coughs> a useful result. So this is very difficult. Um, there are claims that you can see distinctions if you do look at large groups, but I'm, I'm not convinced yet. Um, the uh, Heidi, just a quick thing, he- Heidi says, I came here for the autism research because that which she sent just as we were saying, we got, uh, the book is about many, many different things, which is one of the reasons that we didn't get to that. But I, uh, you can go on. I've, I've, Uta's done so there's some really good 15, 20 minute pieces and, and longer with, with Uta describing the development of that uh, idea. So go on the Internet. You will find uh, that. Uh, we'll, we'll end on this one. Uh, Steve would like to know, what are your views on your life flashing before your eyes after the last brain scans of a dying person? person oh yes we saw this paper not impressed not in, we don't believe it <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's all about um correlation is not causation but there's also what brain images talk about is what they get very cross about is reverse inference as we call it so that is to say if a certain bit of the brain is active can you infer what the person was thinking about at the time? And that is extremely difficult. You could probably tell whether a person was thinking about a house or a face, and that would be it. <laughs> so when people say we saw these activity in the brain and therefore the person must have been having this experience, we, we can't. We don't believe that yet. Yeah, remains to be seen. Thank you both so much. I'm sorry. I, I, this always happens, as people know, who regular how to academy. But if if we do the mind, we will never get through all of the questions. Sometimes we just need to do one, which is just audience Q and A. Um, Abby also a message from her. She'd just like to say uh, thank you very much for the answers and says to you, Uta, that you are a legend. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real family affair as well. I should say, Alex Frith, who uh, is Uta and Chris's son, he is also uh, one of the authors of this, and Daniel, who did the illustrations, uh, said. So covers an enormous amount of ground and is a great way into many different ideas about theory of the mind, metacognition, autism, schizophrenia, loads of stuff. Uh, so thank you very much everyone who's joined us uh, tonight. Thank you very much to Luke who's produced this session and most of all thank you very much to Uta and Chris. Thank you Robin. Thank you. Wonderful great. discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>